I have a rather unusual story, and I I don't usually share it because it's quite uh, bizarre. And of course, uh, one always wants to keep one's ego in check. And as soon as I start telling the story, it, it's easy to fall into that ego thing. But at the same time, I've always felt that all of us who gave our lives to Baba should be on this enormous ego trip <laughs> because there are only some six or seven thousand of us in the world. And when you do the math, that works out to about one in a million. Wow. Wow. So. Thank you for doing the math. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we never thought about that. Baba made it clear that he was for the few and not for the masses. Mm. And that's certainly true. And when Fantastic. you consider that, that we are one in a million, it seems to me every genuine Bible lover deserves to be on an ego trip. They're very, very <laughs> special people. And that's been so much of a part of coming here and seeing so many old friends and uh, new friends and interacting with others who have just devoted their lives to Baba. It's, to me, one of the most special aspects of coming here. Uh, I came to Baba in 1967. I, uh, I should I introduce myself? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. The whole thing. My name is Alexander Hamilton. I live in uh, north of Boston <laughs> in Newburyport, and I have a wonderful wife, Deborah, and two wonderful kids. And, um, and what are their names, and how old are they? Uh, my son's name is also Alexander. So when people ask me if I'm related to Alexander. <laughs> I can say yes, he's my son. <laughs> and my, what name, what are you, are you seeing? <laughs> it's a famous name in America. <laughs> he's on the $10 bill, but you wouldn't know. <laughs> my daughter, Liza, lives out in Oregon, and she's a mm. Baba artist. She makes felted uh, Babas, little dolls, that mm. uh, have been distributed quite a lot. Oh. And uh, she is totally in love with the son of my best friend. We've both been Baba lovers since 1970. And we used to get together at Myrtle Beach for reunions. So he'd bring his family up from Florida and I'd bring mine down from Mexico. What is his name? Don Bishop. Oh. And Don traveled with me to India this trip. And oh. it's been a wonderful traveling Isn't that companion. Isn't amazing? <laughs> The kids fell in love at Myrtle Beach when they were teenagers. Oh, how sweet! And they went their sweet. separate ways and had other relationships. And then a couple of years ago, they got back together again. Mm -hmm. and how old are totally they? Totally in love with each other. Oh, isn't that fantastic? And they understand their karmic connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Through the years. So anyway, I grew up in Western Massachusetts in a totally dysfunctional family. <laughs> <laughs> I was the youngest of five children. And my father always, uh, his philosophy was that all life is an accident. That God is a total myth, that all religions are just a bunch of mumbo jumbo, and that you know, I shouldn't pay any attention to it. But he did have a great love of nature. Mm. And that passed on to me, and I always felt that God was in nature. But I was frustrated that I couldn't communicate with God. And my frustration became quite intense. I really wanted to understand infinity. I knew that I was living in a dream, and I couldn't get any answers. I wanted to know what was beyond the stars. I wanted to know where the universe was. And I wanted to know what time was all about. When, when did time start? What was there before time? So I decided that the only way I was going to get some answers was to wake myself up from this dream. It's sort of like when you have a nightmare and then you remember it's a dream and you wake yourself up. So I decided I should just kill myself and then I would get some answers. So I was 17 at the time and took an overdose of sleeping pills and was found unconscious and someone delivered me to the emergency room and they pumped my stomach out and then they said, well, you're underage and it's against the law to attempt suicide. So you have your choice. You can either go to prison or a mental hospital. Which would you prefer? 
<laughs> and I thought, well, I guess a mental hospital might be better. Oh, and okay. all of a sudden I was committed to a maximum security uh, mental institution where most of the other patients were Alzheimer's, suffering from Alzheimer's, and uh, most everyone was getting shock treatment. Oh my God, that must be terrifying. It was. I was uh, actually, I turned 18 while I was in this hospital. It's an, I, I don't even say hospital because there were no doctors. The guards would eat our food and <laughs> everyone, uh, they liked to slap one fellow just because he would talk in a different language and he would start screaming. Anyway, mm -hmm. it was uh, a real hell. And I felt like, well, I was in the frying pan and now I've just jumped into the fire. And they called my parents who said, fine, keep him there. We're not going to <laughs> let him out. So uh, fortunately, I had a good psychiatrist who managed to get me transferred to a, a real hospital, Mass General, which was an excellent hospital. But they, the, the difference was they didn't lock the door at Mass General. So I escaped, got on a plane, <laughs> flew to California. Were you 18 at this time? Yes. The good thing was that as an 18-year-old, you had to register for the draft at that time. So I was happy to write a letter telling them that I was now a resident of a mental hospital. And I had a psychiatrist write me a wonderful letter about that, how I had a real problem with authority figures. So the next thing I know, I'm in Mass General, and mm. the doctors want to know, why did you attempt to kill yourself? And I said, well, I wanted to know what was beyond the stars. Oh, and they said, yeah. oh yeah, he's really crazy. <laughs> so... I, while I was in this maximum security place, I was at my wit's end. No one knew I was there. I had no friends that and cared. And parents knew you were there. And they weren't willing to get me out. So I reached that point where I said, if there is a God, you're the only one who can get me out of here. Like Kumar. Yeah. Exactly like Kumar, wow, who was in the new life. And he spent 10 years in prison and, and prayed to God, and the doors opened and he was freed. So I found my story very similar to mm -hmm. Kumar's. And many Baba lovers, my generation, either came through prison or, you know, and Baba talks about how the the bird doesn't appreciate his freedom until he's caged. And I remember so well looking through the chicken wire glass and the bars and saying, will I ever feel the wind again? Will I ever mm. smell fresh air again? Or am I going to be locked up here for the rest of my life? Oh, so, yeah, it was pretty traumatic. And uh, I wasn't very happy at Mass General either. And I... Fortunately, there was another patient who was a very wealthy doctor, and he befriended me and said, you really need to get out of here. Let me buy you a plane ticket. You just jump on the subway, go directly to the airport, and you'll be in California. So that's what I did. And of course, I was uh, much influenced by Timothy Leary's slogan, tune in, tune out, uh, tune did, on, and drop out. Did you go to San Francisco? That's exactly where I went, to Haight-Ashbury where it was easy to... What year was that? 1967. I, may have, seen, I may have seen you out there, too. <laughs> a great many of our generation passed through the summer of yeah, love. Yeah. It was quite a unique experience. So one day, a few months later, I'm walking down the street, minding my own business, and there's a guy in a doorway handing out a poster with a picture on it that says, I am the ancient one. I was Rama, I was Krishna, I was this one, I was that one, and now I'm Mayor Baba. This, this photo was on it. Rick Chapman had these posters yeah. made, and a great many people came to Baba through this poster. I took one look at it, and the picture basically came alive to me. I looked in the eyes, and I knew immediately that this was God in front of me. There was this mm. instant recognition. And oddly enough, the first thing I said to this gentleman was, uh, can, can I go see him? Which is kind of odd because I didn't have two nickels to travel to India. But he said, no, you don't need to go see him. He's in seclusion and he's not seeing people, but you don't need to go see him because he's always with you and within you. And I thought, I feel that. And I felt that for 
the next several years because I never met another Bible lover. I didn't know there were any Bible books. We didn't have the internet then. <laughs> so I traveled uh, quite a lot mm -hmm. and always in my travels I felt that Baba was directing me around almost like a puppet. Uh, when I left San Francisco, because I had no money, you could either hitchhike or ride freight trains. So I rode a freight train across country and oddly enough followed the same route that Baba had taken on the Santa Fe Railroad through Albuquerque and on um, mm -hmm. to Chicago. I get back to Boston, uh, just as an example, I pick up a Boston Globe newspaper and I see a, a headline that says, Wanted a Jesus Christ. <laughs> and there was an article about how this actor had just dropped out of this production. And I looked at it and I thought, well, that looks like something Baba would want me to do. <laughs> so I went in and of course with my long hair, they said, oh, you're a natural. <laughs> and this was particularly odd because I knew absolutely nothing about the life of Jesus. You said your prayers. <laughs> Lord's Prayer is as foreign to me as all these other prayers. My wife is very much in love with Jesus, and she's uh, uh, a, a very much a Baba liker, but she's always been devoted to her church and singing in the choir, and, a, and it's a wonderful attachment for her. And we just had our 31st anniversary on Baba's birthday. And, and from the beginning, I said to her, and she understood that her Jesus was my Baba, and my Baba was her Jesus, and she wasn't going to drag me to any church functions, and I wasn't going to drag her to any Baba meetings. So we've gotten along very well in that regard. So anyway, the next thing I know, I'm playing Jesus Christ on stage. Uh, they have me up on the cross, Lama Lama Sabachthani. And I lived through the whole life of Jesus oh, wow. on stage. Yeah. It was quite remarkable. So then, uh, the next thing you know, uh, the draft board decided that everyone who had a psychological deferment ought to come in and have a physical because there were so many who had phony deferments. And to be reevaluated. Exactly. And there was no way I was even going to go in for a physical. So I left the country and went to the island of Crete, where I lived <laughs> in a cave for three months. <laughs> <laughs> which was a wonderful experience. It was uh, an archaeological wonder on the south coast of Crete. Uh, How did you eat while you were there? Mahala. Were you working there? Were you... No, no. Uh, it cost us uh, about 10 cents a day. I, I was with my girlfriend and we lived on rice and watermelon and <laughs> whatever we could find. And uh, there was quite a community, kids from all over the world had <laughs> gone to this, these caves. Um, then I made my way back to London and spent a few months living there. And I hadn't been in touch with my parents for years, so I thought, well, I really ought to send them a postcard, let them know I'm still alive and where I am. And the next thing you know, my mother turns me into the army people oh no and they arrest me at my Mommy. flat in london <laughs> take me off in handcuffs i go in for a physical and of course you have this form you had to check off like uh, do you have nightmares yes do you wet your bed yes and i went through all the lists and then i sat down with this soldier who looked at my my answers and said i'm very sorry but we're not going to be able to take you into the army <laughs> And I was just so disappointed, <laughs> and it allowed me to come back to America. Of course, it was very telling, and afterwards I said to my mother, how could you turn me in? And she said, well, when you didn't show up for your physical, they automatically made you 1A. And once you were 1A, you know, I was basically like AWOL. Yeah. So they kept harassing her as to yeah. where I was. Yeah. She said, when I found out where you were, I thought I should tell the authorities. <laughs> so, anyway, I get back to Boston, and I, uh, through a mutual friend, was subletting an apartment uh, from a fellow by the name of Bob Aarons. And I mm, went to see his oh, apartment. Oh, I think I've heard of him. Yeah. And I walk in the door, and there's a picture of Bob. Oh. And I say to him, who is this guy? I've been the ancient one? I or just, don't recall. But I think it was a different one. one. 
But uh, I immediately said, who is this guy? What, what, what's this all about? I, I feel like he's been with me for three years now, and I've never met anyone who knew anything about him. So he gave me my first Baba book, The Everything and the Nothing, and talked to me about Baba, and I determined that I really wanted to... He suggested I get a copy of the Discourses, which I did, and I decided I wanted to go to a tropical paradise to really concentrate on the discourses. So I went down to British Honduras, which is now Belize, and I asked around, what's the most remote island? And they said, oh, go to Rotan. And uh, there are three islands there. They said, go to the West End. There's just villagers there. There's no running water, no electricity, no roads. So I go to this little village, and then I find a little house about a mile from the village and as remote as I possibly could. And of course, there was only one more thatched hut beyond me, and the guy played Spanish transistor radio all day long at top volume. So oh, Baba's, is that funny? Baba's little joke. You can go to the ends of the world, and there's always someone there with a transistor radio. <laughs> but it was a wonderful summer, reading the discourses. I kept silence and fasted and uh, felt so connected to Baba. Mm. And then, um, I just before leaving, I picked up a copy of Life magazine, which talked about this Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey College in Florida. And I thought, wow, that's something that Baba would like me to do, because, you know, he's such a clown. <laughs> so I applied, but I didn't know I had gone to Honduras, so I didn't know I had been accepted. Because it had been broadcast in Life magazine, they had thousands of applications the following year. But I just went there presuming, oh, well, they'll probably let me in. Uh, I had some acting experience playing Jesus Christ. <laughs> my girlfriend at the time had a drama degree, and they liked the idea that we were a husband and wife clown team. So as it turned out, we were accepted there. And I was in that... Uh, great proselytizing uh, mentality, of course, so I told some people about Baba, including John Mandillo. Who oh, dear John! A wonderful Baba. Oh, Baba. I love John, yeah. And, uh, and there were several others that were very receptive oh, yeah, to, yeah. to Baba's message. And uh, Adi used to joke about John Mandillo that he dropped out of Harvard Divinity School because he couldn't find Baba, couldn't find God. <laughs> oh God. Went to Clown College and that was where he found God. <laughs> oh, that is funny. I love telling that joke. <laughs> mm. So, uh, my life over the years has just been seemingly directed by Baba. Uh, in the early 70s, I called to try to go to Myrtle Beach and of course, at that time, they were quite swamped with young people. And uh, my dear friend Jane Brown confesses she was probably the one who answered the phone. And when I called and said, well, who do you know? And I said, well, gee, I, I know Bob Ahrens. Never heard of him. And, and the funny thing is, he, Bob had introduced me to Charles Haynes in uh -huh. Boston. But I didn't know Charles was from Myrtle Beach. <laughs> so if I had mentioned Charles' name, maybe I would have gotten in. But in 1980, I decided that I was going to go visit the Bob Center and was delighted to get to know Kitty and Elizabeth and Margaret. And they, so didn't, they didn't say, who do you know again? No, they didn't do that. And when I met Kitty, the first thing she said was, well, when did, when did you learn of Baba? And I explained 1967, and she gave me one of these intense looks and said, that's very significant <laughs> that Baba contacted you while he was still in the body. Yeah. Of course, oh. I didn't think to ask her just what the significance was, but yeah. I too felt that it was real significant. Mm -hmm. So that summer of 1980, I had gone back to school. I was putting myself through school to get a degree in landscape architecture. Always been a great lover of nature and trees as was Kitty, so she immediately hooked me up with Jeff Wolverton, and I had the great pleasure that summer of working with Jeff in Baba's Garden. It was just oh. really delightful. And I used to hang out at Dilruba on the porch, just hoping they would give me a chore to do. They would come up with very random, they'd need a man to do something, go pick up that branch or yeah, go yeah, yeah. move the tables. and. Uh, 
Then one day, uh, Kitty said she well, she was in the process of making her book, and I approached her about making a map of the center. There, there was no map. I was a surveyor at the time, and actually I worked for the same engineering firm that had done all the surveys of Bellamy and Sons. So Elizabeth was delighted that I had gone to work for this company that had done all the work for uh, the center. Of course, my boss, the old man, Bill Bellamy, he, he uh, was invited to the party at, at center. In the early days, they invited all the outsiders to come in and he, to meet Baba, and he decided he really didn't need to go. So he missed his chance to meet God. Yeah. But uh, she thought uh, um, I, was, I was making a map of the particular sites at the center that Baba had some connection with. And at that time, of course, we didn't have Lord Mayor, and I didn't really know about all Baba's visits. So she starts rattling off about, well, in 56 he was up by the library and he said that was where he was going to break his silence. And in 58 he did this over here. And, and, uh, and, and then she told me about the tree that Baba had planted on open day in 1956, uh, where Baba had supposedly planted a tree. Of course, everybody's seen the film or the photos. And Baba doesn't really plant that tree. They just, he blesses it or whatever, and someone else yeah, actually throws the dirt yeah. into the, the uh, to backfill the tree. So Kitty explains the tree died the very first year, there was no water at the barn, and no one took the time to water it. Of course, they were trying to transplant a, a holly tree that was a good four or five feet tall that they just dug out of the woods. And it was the end of June, which is not the time to plant a tree in Myrtle Beach. But anyway, you can't plant, you can't transplant a full-grown holly tree anyway. <laughs> so I was crushed. Baba planted a tree and it died. Died? Yeah. And then all of a sudden her eyes lit up and she said, you know, Baba planted another tree. Baba planted a tree on the last day of his first visit just before getting into the car and driving to Oklahoma. He planted it near the barn, and she and Elizabeth witnessed this. He did it as a way to dedicate and consecrate the center. And she and Elizabeth put a ring of stones around the tree. So she said to me, I want you to go down to the barn and see if this holly tree is still alive. But she they forgot said, about it all the She years? said, I have not thought of this incident in 28 years. Oh, wow. But if you find a ring of stones around a holly tree, that's the tree that Baba planted. So I went all around and dug and dug, and under all the leaves and the decay was the original ring you of stones. You found it. I found it. And it was Incredible. perfectly healthy. It was only about eight or eight feet tall which I was a little taken aback until I later discovered that the holly tree is one of the slowest growing trees and that uh, it takes a good 15 years before it gets established. Where it's was now it? very healthy. It's at least 30 feet tall. I've planted a, a female holly tree. It's one of the unusual trees that needs a male and a female. So in the fall it's covered with red berries and it's a gorgeous tree. And it didn't occur to me until later that the filmed ceremony in 56 was actually a reenactment of what he had done four years prior. Because Elizabeth knew the film crew was coming and they needed to have Baba do something in front of the crowd. And you know how Baba didn't care much about ceremonies. So actually the 56 ceremony was simply a reenactment for the movie camera. The irony is that everybody thinks, if you mention, did Baba plant a tree? Oh, yes, yes, he planted it in 56. Well, actually, mm -hmm. that, that tree didn't survive, but the one he had planted, which was just a seedling, and she emphasized that he planted it with his own hands. Wow. And so, right before that trip, too. Oh, my God. After, in 52. In 52, the last day. So I go back to Kitty, and I'm like, beside myself. 
the, 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 the tree is actually still alive and still there. And she also is very excited about it. And they just forgot. All those years they forgot about it. It's hard to imagine how you could forget such a thing, but uh, uh, I don't know any of the details about who exactly was there to witness it. Kitty uh, knew that Elizabeth had also witnessed it. So when I went back to Kitty, I said to her, you know, shouldn't something be done to somehow let people know this is a very, very special tree? And she uh, always talked in points. And she said, well, the first point is, uh, and when it comes to something like that, the decision is entirely Elizabeth's. So I'll ask Elizabeth, it sounds like a nice idea, but she says, I also need, we need to know the exact date. I know it was the last day of his first visit because everyone got in their cars and I was left on the center with Norena. Everyone left. All the Westerners who had come had already departed a couple of days before. So she said, it's not a problem because if, if Elizabeth does like the idea, she can look it up in her diary and we'll know the exact date. So come back tomorrow and we'll talk about it. So I go back and she said, oh, Elizabeth, really loves the idea. Uh, she'd like you to make a little sign. And, and I said, well, wait a minute. I, I'm not a sign maker. I have, I don't, I'm the worst carpenter. I don't have any <laughs> saw or a hammer or nails or anything. <laughs> and she said, oh, no, no, we, you, 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 you're the one who located the tree. So it's appropriate that you make the sign. <laughs> and, and you have to make it out of sacred wood. And I'm thinking, where am I going to get some sacred wood? Well, as it turns out, they had just replaced the compound fence, which was the French chestnut, the most expensive fencing in the world that Norena had ordered from France. And so then, and she says, go to Jeff and, and he'll tell you where, where that very, very special wood is. And then she says, well, uh, now what is the, what do you think the sign should say? And I said, well, how about uh, this holly tree was planted by Avatar Mayor Bob. No, 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 she says. Baba's <laughs> name goes first. And you don't need the word Avatar. It's just Mayor Baba planted this holly tree, and she had the date, May 20th, 1952. Wow. And she said the final point was that before I installed the sign, I had to take it to Elizabeth for her final approval. I had to show her the finished product and make sure that she liked it and that she wanted it installed. And I met with her very briefly. She liked the sign very much. And she said, she looked in my eyes. She, this was just a few months, six months before she went to Baba. And she said to me, everything associated with Baba's life on earth must be preserved for future generations. This really struck me because I was just a young kid and I had never even thought of the concept of future generations of mm. Baba lovers. She was 80 and of course she was very focused on the future of the Baba community. So she was very enthusiastic about it and I went down and put up the sign. And, and your timing of finding that tree just months before she goes to Baba. Yes, mm. very remarkable. And the wood and the, the whole thing is just, yeah. So I put in the sign. I go back to Boston to finish my college. I get married. I have kids. My wife's not a blah lover. So <laughs> I never went back to Myrtle Beach until 19 years later. In the interim, in 1989, see the sign stood there for almost 10 years. So a lot of the old timers remember that there had been a sign but they thought, well, maybe the tree died, or maybe you know they would come back for a visit. And where was that tree that Baba planted? Well, in 19... they didn't know about the circle of stone. Well, in 1989, Hurricane Hugo mm -hmm. hammered the South Carolina coast, mm -hmm. and they were very concerned that some of the buildings at the center might be destroyed or damaged. As it turns out, a big branch fell and broke the sign. Denny Moore is the one who tells me that it was the only thing, on, only structure of any kind on the center that wow. received any damage whatsoever. Incredible. This sign. 
So I returned to the center uh, 10 years later in 1999, and only the fence posts are there, which I found kind of bizarre. So I went to Jeff and I said, hey, what happened to the sign? And he said, oh, you're the one who put up the sign. We didn't know who made the sign. We thought maybe Bob Brown, because he used to make things yeah, out yeah, of yeah. wood picture frames. Yeah. And we didn't know the story of the sign. And so go talk to Barbara, who's head of the center, and tell her the whole story, which I did. And um, she was not at all receptive. Her response was, well, you know, Kitty was wrong about a lot of things. <laughs> and I said, well, Elizabeth has verified it. Well, we don't know that, do we? You might have cooked this up with Kitty, for all we know. And besides, the tree is only this tall, and it can't possibly be the tree that he planted. And she had lots and lots of reasons why. And Malcolm, uh, the head groundskeeper, didn't like the idea of signage, and he felt it would oh, detract it. from visitors' experience of the center. Uh -huh. And I sat down with him and I tried to explain how that important was this tree yeah. was, and his response was, well, Bob planted all the trees. <laughs> Bob made all the trees. <laughs> so, you know, what's so special? Pretty funny. So over the years, of course, so in character. I, had to, I started doing some research. And lo and behold, Baba, according to Lord Mayer, only planted three trees in his entire life. And this is the only tree that he planted in the Western world. Wow. The other two trees were in India in the early 30s. Wow. And they're well documented. He, he had some nice quotes about Very the trees that cool. he planted. And uh, Kitty, when, when I first found the tree, she said to me, now, you are going to be the keeper of the tree. <laughs> I want you to make sure... No, she was very serious. Yeah. This was no laughing matter. She knew her gardening. She said, I want you to make sure that no vegetation... Draw a wide radius. Don't let any vegetation compete with this tree for light or water. She said, I want you to fertilize it every time you come, which I have done religiously over the years. And uh, I was quite frustrated that uh, the management of the center um, wasn't interested. Yeah. Did you tell them about your research and that's the only tree in the West that Baba actually planted? I'll as, tell you a story off the camera. As so. the years uh, went by, we every time I go to visit, I sit down with Barbara and, uh, and back 10 years ago, I made a replacement side, an exact replica because I still had some of the wood that Kitty had given me. And uh, it sat in the closet there at Del Rubo for, ten, for eight, seven years. I didn't go back for seven years. This uh, incident was Baba's way of keeping me very focused on him. I would have mm -hmm. sleepless nights about this tree. And any Baba lover who would listen to my story, I would recount the story. Mm -hmm. And in a way, uh, see, up to then, I had always been a very anonymous Baba lover. I didn't uh, interact much. I didn't. I only knew a handful of other Baba lovers. But because of this, I had to talk to anybody and everybody who might have been there, like uh, um, uh, Frank Eaton, who oh, I thought Frank, probably yeah. provided the tree very likely, mm -hmm. and he might have been there. The problem was everybody else had left. But it's also very possible that Mara also would have gone with Baba to the barn that morning. All the other Mondali were packing up and getting ready for this mm -hmm. big trip. In my research, I started finding some very peculiar things about the date, May 20th. For example, that's the date that Mara went to Baba yes, in 1989. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's the date Nadja went to Baba right. in 1982, seven years prior. Yeah. And they're the only two women identified in Lord Mayor as being in Baba's inner circle. Really? They are the only two females in Baba's inner circle. I didn't know that. May 20th. I thought it was Mommy and Mara. Everybody likes to say, I thought it was this, I thought it was that. What about so-and-so? Well, he said Mommy had to come back for another life and that she would be a perfect master. So. Right. Um, 
Anyway. Uh, oh, I see. And, and, and Nadja would not come back and neither would Mira. I don't uh, know about Mira. In doing my research, I discovered that Mira, Mira's first day with Mayor Baba was when her mother brought her to Uposny's birthday celebration in the early 20s. It was always celebrated on May the 20th. Wow. Um, Mara had actually seen Baba on the staircase at Yupazni's ashram six months prior, but this was the first full day that she spent with Baba. Most remarkably, it was also the anniversary date of Baba meeting Elizabeth's parents. When Baba came for his second visit in May of 20th, 1932, that was the date that he, 20 years prior, that he met Elizabeth's parents. That's when he gave the flower to Elizabeth, too. That was May 24th. Oh, 24th. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are, it's also listed on Wikipedia that it's Sai Baba's birthday. Uh, and when Mani did the service for Mara after she went to Baba, she made a point of it being uh, poor, poor, uh, it was a red letter day in India. May the 20th was Buddha Purnima, which is the day he gained enlightenment. Wow. The other odd thing I read in Mara Meher is that a year before Mara went to Baba, Mani decided she really needed to write her obituary in advance because she knew that when the time came, she would be beside herself. So she spent a couple of days writing out Mara's obituary. And she handed it to Erich for safekeeping. And he wrote the date on it, May 20th, 1988, exactly one year prior to her going to Baba. It's in Mara, Mara. So uh, there are uh, so many of these odd uh, dates. And if you read Elizabeth's account of Baba meeting her parents, she, of course, had met Baba in November of 31 on his first visit. And she writes that May the, 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 she had anticipated the date of introducing Baba to her parents. It was the most significant day in, in, that she had had up to that point. She just knew that it was a monumental day. And she even writes, because she wrote it some years later, describing this, that she had waited a year and a half for Baba to meet her parents, when actually it was only six months. In her mind, mm. it had been a year and a half. It had been such a long time. Mm. But she last saw Baba on December 6th of 1931, which is also the date that she went to Baba, one of the most significant dates in her life. She had just found her master in 1931. And on December 6th, he sailed away. And none of them knew if they would ever see Baba again. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's interesting that she would have gone to Baba on that day. Mm -hmm. And there's all these inner connections that are very mysterious regarding all this. One of the oddest is that when Baba went, came for his 58th visit, he took back to India a film of the ceremony that was done in 56. And Mani writes how thrilling it was to watch the film of Baba planting the tree, and here he was in the room with them watching the film. She, she writes to, to uh, Myrtle Beach about mm -hmm. this event. It's in the family letters. And she says how, how astounding it is to actually see Baba with all the Western lovers planting this tree, and then here they are in India watching it. Mm -hmm. And so they ask Baba, how is your tree doing? And of course, the tree had died that first year. But Baba said, oh, my tree is doing very well. <laughs> and of course, he was referring the to tree. the tree just a hundred feet away that he had planted in 1952. Oh, amazing. Amazing. It's a, a story that 
caused me to seek out anyone and everyone who might have been there. Mm. So I talked to Darwin and Jean, who were there, and I talked to Adele, who was there. And Did I you talk to, to Frank? I didn't talk to Frank uh, at that time. Okay. Um, and I hadn't put two and two together. You see, uh, Frank was always a very dear to me because he was the, one of the first caretakers with Darwin, but he hadn't met Baba. And he was a Baba lover for eight years before he met Baba. When Baba came in 52, Frank had been the caretaker for eight years. And he and I always liked the fact that he became a Baba lover without having to actually meet Baba face to face. So that was when he met Baba was 52. 52. Now. And it's very likely he might have had a hand in providing the holly tree. On the other hand, I, I think more likely Baba picked out the tree to transplant, especially since it was a female holly, and it would have just been just a seedling, because after 28 years, it had only gotten to this high. Also, of course, the holly tree is a very sacred tree, uh, and I discovered that it can live to be over 500 years old, and that the largest holly tree in the United States is growing in South Carolina. You're kidding. Wow. So. Baba knew what he was doing when he Isn't picked that amazing? a holly tree. When you go back through all the ancient civilizations, nearly every one worshipped the holly. Wow. It was regarded as a protector plant. The American Indians would tie it at the doorway of their teepees. The ancient Chinese, the Druids, every <coughs> culture. Wow had a connection with the holly tree, and of Don't course, do they think that the derivation of the tree is from the word holy. Oh, yeah. Oh. But it was always regarded as a protector tree. Wow. Anyway, uh, I didn't understand why this tree would have been unrecognized for 28 years. Amazing. And then he had a and then it had a sign on it for 10 years. Amazing. And then the sign was removed 17 years ago by the storm uh -huh. in 1999. Ah, ah, ah. I wonder if, if any of Frank's kids, you know, the. Well, I wrote to Frank and uh, to his son to see if maybe Frank Frank's Jr. diary had any record of this event. Yeah. Um, I gave Frank's diary, which was very sparse, to Nashua. A diary, I don't yeah. know if he... That's the that thing, you never yeah. know what's... I am certain that it's in Elizabeth's diary, but uh -huh. I don't have that. And it may be the only place that it is written. Mm. And it would be particularly significant if Mara was also with him, which oh, I strongly yeah. suspect. When Baba said, on my last day, I'm going to take every day, he would walk to the barn from his house. Yeah. And, of course, Elizabeth and Kitty would go with him, and I'm quite sure Mara would have been there. If they well. went, yes. Mara so would So the dates I would think. Yeah. Um, are quite interesting to note. Mm -hmm. Well, I continue to be fascinated with Baba's time in America. And... Oh, excuse me. Wanted to know about each and every visit, where he went, who he met. Uh, there was it was very sketchy in Lord Mayor. Uh, in the mid '90s, I drove out to the Heartland Center, mm -hmm. and with Hermes' help, identified where Baba and the group stayed on their way. But interestingly, where they stayed on the last night in Ozark, Arkansas was unknown. And so I went and interviewed the neighbors and with the help of a couple other Baba lovers who interviewed Meru, she verified that this, these cabins were right next to a creek called Pond Creek Motor Lodge. And I went and talked to all the neighbors and I found out exactly where the site was. And I took her pictures and I drew a little map and Julia Ross put it in her wonderful book, uh, The Trail of Tears. Yeah. Uh, and she also mentioned the holly tree story Did in that she? book. Did she? Good. Which was, I always appreciated because it's really been the only time it's been printed. But this was such a significant spot 
And having been a real estate broker, uh, I was at the time, I went up to the owner of the house and I said to them, you know, this is a very special area. Uh, oddly enough, the spot where the cabins were uh, was a, a, a still in its original condition. The Highway 64 that Baba had driven out, most all of it had been repaved and relocated. But this small half mile stretch of the dirt road was exactly the same as when Baba had been there. So I went to the owner of the house and I said, you know, I just love this area and here's my business card. If you ever decide to sell, please give me a call. So I haven't heard back yet, but I suspect one of these days I'll get a phone call. Anyway, jumping ahead, I happened to bump into someone at the Northeast Gathering. I happened to sit down for lunch with a man I always had enormous regard for uh, by the name of Nashawan Anzar. <laughs> and Nashawan, of course, is one of the only people that I know that Baba directly said to him, tell the world that I am God in human form. <laughs> And so he has done that through his publication, Glow Magazine. So when I sat down to lunch and he learned I was from Massachusetts, immediately he said, well, have, have you been up to the house in New Hampshire that Baba went to visit? There's a famous photo of the group of, of him, uh, Meredith Starr and Chanji and Adi, all standing in front of a barn. And I said, oh yes, of course, I've been there more than once. It's a, it's a beautiful setting, and uh, th this is the photo, and it has them all standing in front of the barn. Bring it over here. Oh, is it not on the screen? Uh, well, you want to have it close, but I want to show it here first. Oh. Want to, um, closer, closer, closer. So Nashawan says to me, I want you to go up there and make sure we've got okay. the right barn. Okay. Ken Lux wrote a wonderful article about this visit to this property, as it turned out, the group of people who met Baba in 1931 were all friends of Malcolm and Jean Schloss. And the summer before Baba arrived, they had all been living in a house up in New Hampshire. And Ken Lux went and, and found that house and did a wonderful article and with pictures of the house. It was in the mid-90s. Uh, but he was mistaken in thinking that this was the house that Baba actually owned. You see, both uh, when Baba arrived, there was a very wealthy woman who immediately accepted him as her master. Uh, her name was Kath Gardner. Uh, she was the niece of Isabella Stewart Gardner, who has a very famous museum in Boston. And she, upon meeting Baba, said, I want to give you my 100-acre farm and farmhouse up in New Hampshire. It would be wonderful for a Baba Center. And he said, okay. And they decided to take a day trip to go up to New Hampshire and view this property that she had given him. Oddly enough, it's the only property in America that Baba ever owned in his own name. Uh, other than the Myrtle Beach for some years. Um, he, it did not work out, it didn't become a center after all, and he wound up giving it back to her two years later. But I, uh, having been a surveyor, uh, and, and at Nash's directive of make sure we have the right barn, uh, I knew it was the right barn, but I thought, well, I better go do a full title search and confirm that this was the house that she had given Baba. And once I did the title search, I found that she owned two properties. And the other property was located in the ne next town called Greenfield. And the original house where this whole group had, had the uh, first hippie commune, I think, <laughs> in 1931, uh, was in the town of Hancock. So I tracked down exactly where the house was located. I tracked down the owner's names and 
I, with great <laughs> apprehension, called the owners and told them that I had been doing some research. I, I was, I was very conscious of the fact that either they were going to tell me, forget about it, we, we don't want to know anything about it, and shut the door, or they were going to invite me over to see the house. So I had, in my research, I had worked with the town historian, a fellow named Lenny. So I said to them, well, I've discovered some interesting historical facts about your house. And I met with Lenny, the town historian, and she said, oh, Lenny's a good friend of ours. Why don't you come right on over? Ah. <laughs> and they are the most wonderful couple. We've gotten to be very close over the years. We've had quite a number of tours of the house. And um, they're most gracious. Uh, they've been there since 1970. The house itself is quite fantastic. It's a 1775 colonial. It was part of the Underground Railroad. Oh, and wow. And there's a Isn't secret room me? behind the fireplace. <gasps> oh, and these wow. These are the pictures of the house and oh, the interior of the house. Oh, my goodness. I think See, behind that camera. fireplace is a secret room? Yes, where they hid the slaves who were escaping from Boston to get up to Montreal. If they, wow. they had gotten themselves to Boston, it was a direct route to get up oh to... Oh, my God. Let me show you here. Okay, wait a minute. Uh -huh. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Oh my God. That's out of time. and I'm that's the. Out of time. Uh, Are you running out of time? Oh my uh -huh. God, that's amazing. Well, anyone who's interested, this appeared in Glow magazine in uh, two years ago, in the uh, the summer issue, 2014. Now there's that. There's the fireplace, and there's the, and there's the house, yeah. Wow. And in the meantime, so cool. Nashawan is, is, at some point is traveling <laughs> in India, and someone gives him a shoebox of photos and says, is there anything in here that you haven't seen before? And sure enough, here's a picture of the woman who gave Baba the house, oh. Calf Gardener, oh, with wow. Baba. And Meredith Starr wow. and Ollie. That was in the box of, of this. Of just photographs. And you see, Nashawan could read behind Hancock Hotel. <gasps> so he knew immediately where the picture was taken. And this building is still there. And you can stand on the spot where Baba you stood. Shut on your screen. It's right across the street from the very historic. Hancock Inn, which is one of the oldest and inns in America. There? This, this is there? now an apartment building. And there were other photos what taken of Baba at this site. Does that show all right? People could, can just get a copy of this magazine. Yeah, yeah which, which issue it's is it? It's the summer issue of 2014. Okay. This is what 20... the cover looks okay. like. Good. There's another shot of Baba standing in front of a tree in front of the Hancock Hotel, oh. which in, appears in Lord Mayor, but it says it was taken somewhere in England. Wow. Oh, okay. So <laughs> there were wonderful pictures, and we had a, a wonderful group tour. Uh, the, the owners have let me bring people oh. over and over again. Uh, we send Christmas cards this to each other. This is the house that was given to Baba? Yes, this is the only property that Baba owned uh, in New England in 1930. From 31 do they still to have that? Do they still have that hundred acres? It's been reduced now to 18 acres, but it's still very private and would make a wonderful Sahaba Center or a Baba Center yeah. someday in the future. Uh, yeah. The owners have made it clear they're not ready to sell, but uh, we're very good friends at this point. And and he said to me on one of my recent visits, "You know more about this house than we do." <laughs> <laughs> so.